In the first part of this series, we have looked at the sense of hearing. In this part, we want to describe the sense of balance in a simple way. It is highly recommended to watch the first part first, as it explains the general structure of our ear. Our sense of balance is part of the inner ear, which is located in the petrous part of the temporal bone. In the first part of the series, we have discovered the cochlea. The cochlea allows us to hear. For the sense of balance, humans have the vestibular system, which consists of three semicircular canals and the vestibule. The vestibular system has three semicircular canals, each with an ampulla. Two small sacs are also present in our vestibular system. The system shown here is filled with a fluid and consists of the cochlear duct, the two small sacs and their connections, the endolymphatic sac and the semicircular canals with the ampullae. Let us first take a closer look at the utricle and saccule. Both saccule and utricle possess a macula. The macula is positioned vertically in the saccule and horizontally in the utricle. The macula consists of a jelly-like substance in which small stones, known as stateliths, are embedded. The relative movement of these small stones is transmitted to the stereocilia of the hair cells, which are located below the statoliths. Each hair cell has about 70 stereocilia and an additional kinocilium. As we have already seen in the animation on the sense of hearing, the stereocilia have small tip links. When the stereocilia are pushed to the right, these small bands relax and close the ion channels. When the stereocilia are pushed to the left, the tip links stretch and open the channels. The influx of potassium ions from the surrounding fluid triggers a reaction within the hair cell, which generates electrical signals that are transmitted to the brain. More information on how tip links and ion channels work can be found in the first part of this series. We can also clearly see that not all hair cells point in the same direction, but that some hair cells are rotated by 180 degrees. The area in which the hair cells change direction is called striola. Both utricle and saccule have a striola. It runs through the center of each macula and divides the hair cells into two oppositely oriented groups. The small arrows represent the orientation of the approximately 30,000 hair cells in the utricle. We can clearly see that the striola has an arcuate course and that there are hair cells for every possible direction. When the utricle moves, only hair cells are deflected which are aligned along the direction of movement. The brain receives impulses of different intensity from these hair cells and uses them to calculate the head's acceleration or position. When the stereocilia are bent in the direction of the kinocilium, the hair cells send high-frequency impulses to the brain. However, stereocilia that are deflected in the other direction will lead to the production of low-frequency signals. Now let's take a closer look at how and why the stereocilia move. The stereocilia which, like the stones, are embedded in the jelly-like substance, move because the small stones are either displaced or remain in place. We can use a jelly on a plate to help us understand. There is a flexible rod in the middle, which is supposed to represent a stereocilium. If the plate is accelerated to the left, we can see that the inertia of the jelly leads to the flexible stick being bent. Here again in slow motion. As soon as we rotate the plate, gravity will cause the jelly to bend the stick downwards. This works even better with the help of statholiths, which in this case are chocolate lentils. We can observe exactly the same effect when our head accelerates forwards. The inertia of the statholiths means that the hair cells are accelerated immediately, but the statholiths are accelerated later. This results in the deflection of the stereocilia. 
The head position can also be determined by utricle and saccule. The Earth's gravity pulls statholiths downwards and thereby deflects stereocilia of the hair cells. The semicircular canals, which we will look at in more detail in a moment, are necessary for sensing rotational acceleration. But first, let's have a close look at the exact position of each macula. As already mentioned, the macula of the utricle is positioned horizontally and that of the saccule vertically. If we enlarge each macula, their position and location within the head is very easy to recognize. With the help of the left and right inner ear, it is therefore possible for us to determine linear accelerations in three-dimensional space, forwards and backwards, to the right and left, and upwards and downwards. We can also recognize the position of the head and therefore of our body, as the hair cells do not adapt. People can therefore tell whether they are standing or lying on their back. The hair cells of the utricle are oriented in the direction of the striola. In contrast, the hair cells of the saccule are oriented away from the striola. This enables the precise calculation of head position and linear acceleration. However, utricle and saccule can hardly sense rotational movements of the head. The three semicircular canals, which have ampullae, are necessary for rotational accelerations. As we already know, the duct system shown here contains a fluid known as endolymph. The ampullae also contain hair cells, which are located on a small bulge known as the crista ampullaris. Like the hair cells of the utricle and saccule, these hair cells are embedded in a gelatinous membrane. This membrane is called cupula, and unlike the membranes in the utricle and saccule, does not contain any statholytes. To better understand how the ampulla works, let's take a look at it from the side. The cupula is a very soft tissue that will give way to slight over or under pressure. This causes the stereocilia of the hair cells to be deflected to the left or right. As with the hair cells in the utricle and saccule, the deflection of the stereocilia leads to the generation of action potentials which reach the brain via nerve pathways. In order to be able to analyze the functioning of the semicircular canals in detail, we enlarge the labyrinth, which is usually smaller than one inch. The three canals lie in three different planes that are approximately perpendicular to each other. If we project the semicircular canals onto virtual walls, we can more easily recognize the planes covered by them. The ampulla of the horizontal canal covers rotational movements of the head in the horizontal plane. When the head turns sideways, the inertia of the fluid in the semicircular canal exerts pressure on the flexible cupula, causing it to bulge and thus deflect the stereocilia. As an analogy, imagine a hollow glass ring with water and a flexible rubber. When the ring rotates, the rubber is deformed by the inert mass of the water. Here we can once again see the different acceleration of the ring in red and the water in blue. The horizontal canal is tilted upwards by approximately 30 degrees, so that it is horizontal when the head is in a natural position. The anterior semicircular canal, shown here in orange, is important for detecting forward and back head movement, like nodding. In order to correctly perceive a tilt of the head towards the shoulder, we need the posterior semicircular canal, which is shown here in blue. Both the hair cells of the cochlea 
and the hair cells of the vestibular system send action potentials to our brain via the eighth cranial nerve, also known as the vestibulocochlear nerve. The utricle, saccule, and each of the three impulli have their own nerve tracts, the cell bodies of which are called ganglions. The vestibular nerve then forms the vestibular cochlear nerve with the cochlear nerve. As already mentioned, the action potentials produced by the hair cells are sent to our brain via the vestibular cochlear nerve. The electrical signals first reach certain nerve cells located in the medulla oblongata. Scientists refer to the collection of these nerve cells as nuclei. The signals from the vestibular system are processed by the vestibular nuclei and the signals from the cochlea by the cochlear nuclei. The vestibular nuclei process the incoming electrical signals from the three semicircular canals as well as from utricle and saccule. In addition, electrical signals from numerous other sources such as the cerebellum are included in the processing. Finally, numerous brain regions receive the processed signals so that we can effectively maintain balance. However, we need the vestibular system and its semicircular canals not only for our balance. Our eyes are also moved with the help of the vestibular canals and sacs. The semicircular canals are connected to the muscles of our eyes via the vestibular nuclei and other brain regions. When the head moves, the stereocilia are deflected on both sides, which results in strong impulses being sent from one side and weak impulses being sent from the other side. The muscles are correspondingly contracted on one side and relaxed on the other. In this way, the eyes remain fixed on one point, even with smaller or larger head movements. This focusing of the eyes on one point when the head moves is known as the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Further information can be found in the animations on the eye, brain and ear, as well as on the websites.